They've got to hold on to HIV. Why? To hold on to their funding. It's a disgrace uh, for any other disease. Uh, with this much disagreement about the cause, we would by now have a balanced portfolio. They're dispersing AZT to 200,000 Americans in the name of a hypothesis that stands unproven, a talk that is the most toxic talk that has ever been licensed in long-term consumption in the free world. How the United States gave AIDS to the world. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, known best by its acronym. Four letters we've been told to fear. The AIDS crisis is very real. Its dark form casts a shadow over the statistics of the dead and dying. Virtually none existed in 1980. By 1995, AIDS had afflicted over one and a half million lives globally, half a million in the United States alone. AIDS has become the leading singular cause of death in U.S. males between the ages of 25 and 44. It's been called the plague of this century and portrayed like some medieval nightmare. It knows no pity and respects no limits. We've been told that it can strike anyone and everyone is at risk. For over 15 years now, AIDS has terrorized social America, and still there is no cure. What causes AIDS? We've been told that AIDS is caused by this tiny retrovirus, its name is HIV, and virtually everyone who is infected with it is expected to develop any one of 30 different diseases, all of which ultimately result in death. To stop HIV and AIDS, the U.S. government has enacted emergency measures, spent $40 billion and mobilized the greatest scientific research effort in the history of man. The war against AIDS has spent more money and utilized more scientific talent than it took to land on the moon. All this to fight a microscopic enemy, and still there are no certain results. After 15 years, the public asks, why? There is a good explanation as to why the war against AIDS has been a total failure. We've spent all our time and money trying to stop this virus, HIV. And as many top research scientists have tried to point out, this virus is not the cause of AIDS. For over 10 years, this argument against HIV has been dismissed by the government, suppressed in the media, and disputed by the political economic powers of the AIDS industry. Yet, since 1987, a growing group of scientists continue to make this unnerving allegation. AIDS research has not failed because it never found a cure. AIDS research has failed because it never found the cause. Is this virus, HIV, really the cause of AIDS? If it isn't, why are we being told this? The virus that causes AIDS. The virus that causes AIDS. The AIDS virus. HIV. The virus that the virus. The virus that causes AIDS. The public has been very supportive, yet with over a hundred thousand research papers published on HIV and AIDS, there is still no direct proof HIV causes immune deficiency. The entire government-funded approach to fighting AIDS is based on this unproven hypothesis hanging from a frayed thread, and with the weight of mounting evidence against it. This hypothesis is in serious trouble. In fact, the entire international effort to stop AIDS has all its eggs in one beaker. Time, money, treatment, and millions of human lives hang in the balance. If HIV is not the cause of AIDS, millions of people have been told that they're going to die for no reason at all, and hundreds of thousands have been treated with permanently impairing drugs, some of which could cause AIDS themselves. If HIV does not cause AIDS, how many lives have been lost to a misdiagnosis, and how many more will die in the future? In the next few minutes, we will present 10 scientific arguments that explain why HIV does not cause AIDS, what the causes could be, and why treatments with dangerous drugs like AZT are unnecessary and cause the very disease they're supposed to prevent. We will also explain to you why this information has been kept back from the public awareness and why the U.S. Department of Health, the pharmaceutical industry, and AIDS activist organizations have perpetrated this myth. As citizens, taxpayers, and people who also someday could be at the mercy of a misguided program like this, we hope you will see the importance of this issue. 
Is HIV the cause of AIDS? If not, as Neville Hodgkinson of the London Sunday Times put it, then we will have witnessed the greatest medical scientific blunder of the 20th century. nearly everyone has been affected by AIDS. Whether it's a friend or a lover, a business acquaintance, or even a perfect stranger, AIDS has had an impact on our entire culture. The dread hangs silently over society, and there's little hope on the horizon. It's time we ask ourselves some serious questions. Could we be on the wrong track with HIV? Have we jumped to conclusions that will only lead to a dead end? Are we willing to accept the truth, even if it means that our whole campaign against AIDS has been in vain. To understand just how HIV became the target of this international war on AIDS, we have to look back at how it all began, but set into motion the chain of events that many say misled objective science. Following the depression of the 30s and World War II, America emerged into a new era of technology and prosperity. We had more time for recreation and self-realization. Society began to change. Medical science had new breakthroughs. We conquered polio, the last great infectious epidemic of the modern world. Soon, new antibiotics cured everything from minor infections to venereal disease. With the invention of the birth control pill came the sexual revolution, freeing the public from age-old fears and taboos. Homosexuality, too, found more freedom of expression as gays came out of the closet and formed their own subculture. During the Vietnam era of the 60s, recreational drug use skyrocketed among the young and would continue to grow. Yet, we remained optimistic that we could solve all our problems through our new faith in science and technology. But before long, the unforeseen consequences of this new liberated lifestyle began to rear its ugly head. Silently in the lines, the bell began to toll. When the first reports of immune deficiency surfaced in 1981, among a small group of gay men in Los Angeles, it was believed to be a result of behavior unique to homosexuals. But all that changed when similar conditions started showing up in IV drug users and hemophiliacs. That set off an alarm. What had been called gay-related immune deficiency now appeared to be an infectious disease that might spread throughout the entire population. This threat of a deadly blood disease being spread by sexual contact was sensationalized by the media and enraged gay activists who demanded action from the government. Public health officials issued strong warnings that this new immune disease could be acquired sexually by anyone. Suddenly, immune suppression common to drug addicts, homosexuals, advanced TB patients, and scores of other diseases became linked together in a microbiological search for a common cause. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, was born. As the bathhouses in San Francisco closed and the fear of AIDS spread, the U.S. Department of Health came under heavy fire to find the cause and remedy quickly. The public was willing to believe science could provide a quick fix. So the funding began to roll in, and the huge army of virus hunters, who had been unemployed after the unsuccessful virus cancer program, went back to work. They now turned their full attention towards finding the cause and cure for AIDS. Scientists began to speculate that AIDS patients lack the ability to fight infection in blood due to a shortage of T cells that coordinate immunity. In the blood, there are two basic kinds of cells, the red blood cells that carry oxygen and nutrients to all the body, and the white blood cells that hunt down, kill, and destroy infecting bacteria and viruses. When an infection occurs, white blood cells must increase rapidly and produce antibodies to fight it off. They do this through the use of CD4 T cells that act like infection detectives. T cells identify invading viruses, then alert the B lymphocyte blood cells to produce antibodies which attack the infection. In a normal immune system, there are about 600 to 1200 of these T cells in one microliter of blood plasma. But in an AIDS patient, the number of T cells drops down below 200 and lower. This is what is believed to be the direct cause of AIDS. 
Even this is questionable, though, because many AIDS patients have few or no T cells and remain healthy. But one thing is certain. People with AIDS are losing the ability to generate a strong blood defense against opportunistic infections that constantly attack the body. So, as AIDS progresses, the victim becomes less and less capable of recovering from common diseases like pneumonia, tuberculosis, and the flu. Eventually, the immune system gives out altogether, and the body is ravaged by disease, resulting in death. The objective is clear. Stop what is killing T cells and weakening the immune system, and you have found the cure for AIDS. But what exactly is killing the T cells? Is it really HIV? In the beginning, a number of different causes were suggested. Drugs like heroin, cocaine, pop, barbiturates, and amphetamines had all been observed to harm the immune system. Also, malnutrition, repeated infection, overuse of antibiotics, and stress. But these behavior-related causes were politically incorrect with gay activists who wanted to distance themselves from the idea that AIDS might be self-inflicted. And government-funded research programs needed money and promised results. So, the decision was made politically to abandon the behavior AIDS model for the infectious epidemic model, and the virus hunters pressed on, self-convinced that AIDS could be stopped by a vaccine or a treatment. Two of these were Robert Gallo from the National Cancer Institute and Max Essex from Harvard, who had made public speculations by 1982 that AIDS might be caused by a retrovirus. Gallo's earlier research with retroviruses in the cancer program had been a failure. None of the viruses he studied could be directly linked to the cause of a disease, and his research yielded no benefit to the patient whatsoever. But one virus, HTLV-3, got Gallo's full attention. It was this virus, or as Gallo claimed, a variant of it, that would become the virus that causes AIDS. Fight that! Fight that! Fight that! Riding the whirlwind of public demand, Gallo made his move. On April 23, 1984, Secretary of Health and Human Services Margaret Heckler and Robert Gallo called a press conference together that would involve the United States Department of Health in what critics claim would become the biggest medical scientific blunder of all time. First, the probable cause of AIDS has been found a variant of a known human cancer virus called HLT, HTLV-3. With HTLV-3, Gallo's white elephant virus program made the jump from the cause of cancer to become the cause of AIDS and the target of billions of dollars in research funds. Simultaneously, as the press conference was going on, the test used to detect HIV was being patented, which would earn the U.S. Department of Health over $100 million a year and large financial kickbacks to Robert Gallo. The AIDS industry was born, and the U.S. government was now fully invested. Naively, Secretary Heckler predicted that a vaccine would be ready for testing by 1986. We hope to have such a vaccine ready for testing in approximately two years. For the moment, everyone was happy about the discovery of the probable cause of AIDS. Gay activists were satisfied that the government was finally doing something. But the public was not aware that Gallo had bypassed a major checkpoint before making his announcement. He had not submitted his test results to other scientists for peer review. No one had a chance to critique or verify his claim, and his test results were not published in Science Magazine until one week after the press conference. This was a dangerous violation of scientific protocol. Suddenly, a challenge to Gallo's ethics emerged, which would become an international scandal. The Institut Pasteur in Paris claimed that Gallo's AIDS virus was identical to LAV, a virus Dr. Luc Montagnier had sent Gallo's lab six months before the press conference. The French were outraged and filed an international lawsuit against the U.S. Health Department on grounds that Gallo had pirated their discovery. The entire incident was embarrassing to the United States and had to be resolved diplomatically by President Reagan and Prime Minister Jacques Chirac of France. With this arrangement to split the profits made on the HIV blood test, the virus was given a new international name, the Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. Despite questions of Gallo's character and ethics, HIV had now gained international acceptance. But when Gallo's HIV results were finally published in Science Magazine, only 44 of 93 AIDS patients he tested, that's less than half, 
had the virus. Yet Gallo claimed that in further studies, he could find HIV in up to 90% of those he tested. As other virologists reproduced Gallo's research, they found similar correlations between HIV and AIDS patients. This high correlation seemed convincing to everyone that HIV must have something to do with causing AIDS. Everyone, that is, except Dr. Peter Duesberg. At the University of California in Berkeley, Duesberg became a world-renowned retrovirologist in the cancer program and the first man to map the genetic structure of retroviruses like HIV back in 1970. His honors include membership in the National Academy of Sciences due to his discovery of cancer-causing genes. Having researched retroviruses for over 30 years, some have called him the world's foremost expert in retrovirology. Dr. Duesberg was somewhat skeptical of Gallo's AIDS virus announcement. I wasn't madly impressed by it because what else would you expect from a person like Gallo who had studied retroviruses all his life that he would say retroviruses cause AIDS. That seemed to me the first coincidence that made me wonder whether that was an authentic claim or going to be an authentic claim but um, I would say uh, it was not a surprise that he would say that. He said it before that it would cause leukemia or things like Alzheimer disease, neurological diseases, and it failed. So this one, I was not too impressed that this would, was going to be a winner now. And it would have been for the first time that a retrovirus would have been pinned down as a cause of a human disease or even a disease in wild animals. For 18 months, Peter Duesberg studied every scientific publication on HIV and AIDS he could get a hold of. When he finally published his observations in cancer research in 1987, he stood alone against the tide of popular opinion and the government-funded AIDS industry. His position has become well known. He argues that HIV is not causing AIDS. It's a harmless passenger virus that has lived in humans for centuries without causing diseases. He believes AIDS is the result of other non-infectious factors like drug use. And ironically enough, AZT, the highly toxic medication prescribed to treat AIDS patients, actually does what the virus cannot, that is, causes AIDS itself. Though Dr. Duesberg's arguments were ridiculed by many and ignored by most, many of his colleagues studied his research and came to the same conclusion. Something is terribly wrong with the war on AIDS. Dr. Richard Stroman recalls the impact of Duesberg's arguments in cancer research. It was a remarkable review, and it raised the fundamental issues about virus, virus, uh, uh, viruses as a cause of both cancer and, and immunosuppression, uh, basic questions that haven't been really responded to in any meaningful way in, in, uh, in the almost 10 years since that paper was published. Soon other top scientists joined Duesberg and Stroman in questioning the HIV hypothesis also. Nobel Prize winners Dr. Walter Gilbert of Harvard and Kerry Mullis who invented the PCR. Dr. Charles Thomas, a former Harvard professor, organized a consortium of 12 signatories to address the issue. They would in time become the group for scientific reappraisal of the HIV AIDS hypothesis. We started out by uh, writing a letter to Nature calling for a reappraisal of the evidence for and against the hypothesis that HIV did in fact do all these things. And um, there were about 10 or 12 signatories to this letter and it was rejected even though many uh, of the signers of the letter were certainly reputable people. We tried Nature magazine and it, it was ignored. And then we tried the New England Journal, JAMA and so forth and Lancet. In each case, we were rejected. That they would not publish this letter. It was only four sentences long. It read, um, it is widely believed by the general public that a retrovirus called HIV causes a group of diseases called AIDS. Many biomedical scientists now question this hypothesis. We propose a thorough reappraisal of the existing evidence for and against this hypothesis be conducted by a suitable independent group. We further propose that critical epidemiological studies be devised and undertaken. Now, that is certainly a hardly a bomb-throwing letter, but nonetheless, they would have none of it. And being rejected made us angry, so we decided to extend the list of signatories. 
So it jumped to 30, and then to 50, and then to 100. And then by 1994, up to uh, 600, 188 of whom have advanced degrees. We publish a newsletter. We have a website. So it's a fairly large organization now. Though the scientific establishment has continually ignored Duisburg and the group for reappraisal, some individuals are having second thoughts. At the San Francisco International AIDS Conference in 1990, Dr. Luc Montagnier, who discovered the virus originally, six months before Gallo's claim, made a startling statement. HIV might be harmless. Against his own interest, Montagnier's statement should have been earth-shaking. But the conventioners paid it little attention and went right on talking about new antiviral drug treatments. Why is the scientific community ignoring the dangerous ramifications of this essential question about the cause of AIDS? Do we have an answer? Yes, in retrospect, we certainly do. Too many people are making too much money out of it. And money is much stronger than truth. If the AIDS establishment will not respond to this issue, then it's time that the public heard the evidence against HIV and demand answers. For the next few minutes, we'll show you why HIV fails as the cause of AIDS and what the real causes could be. We will also explain to you why AIDS is not being caused by conventional sex and clean needle and safe sex programs will do little to stop AIDS. You'll have to pay close attention and do some thinking. First, 10 scientific reasons why HIV is not the cause of AIDS. To begin with, let's take a close microscopic look at the virus itself. Number one, HIV, like all other viruses, is harmless after antibody immunity. HIV is a retrovirus. Retroviruses reproduce themselves through a process called reverse transcription. Its receptacle attaches to the coating of the T cell. It penetrates the cell and encodes its RNA genes into the cell's DNA. And as the cell multiplies, the new viruses break free and go on to reproduce themselves in other cells. Like all viral infections, HIV reproduces rapidly immediately after it infects the body, causing a slight fever and some cold symptoms. But nature has given the human body a built-in defense called antibodies. These tiny protein molecules are generated by the B lymphocyte blood cells to track down and kill invading infections like HIV. Antibodies scour the entire system until all the invading germs are dead or become dormant and inactive. Antibodies are the reason why we get well after a cold and become immune to diseases like chickenpox or the measles. Ironically, when a person is tested for HIV with the blood test, they are not testing for the virus, but the antibody that has been generated to stop it. When a person tests positive to HIV, they have produced their own antibody vaccine which means they are now immune to the virus. All infectious diseases must win the race against the immune system's antibodies to kill the host. There are no known diseases that ever reemerge to cause the illness after the antibodies have done their job. No, there's no such disease, no precedent for it. All other microbes cause diseases primarily before immunity, before antibodies are around. And that's the only reason why you and I are talking now, because antibodies protect us against microbes. Once you have antibodies, you're safe against these microbes. The whole basis for vaccination, 200 years old, Edward Jenner came up with that, or others too, but he did, he's, he's the name in it. There's not one precedent where a microbe only causes disease after immunity. Some come back, there are always some marginal exceptions if you, well, to this generalization. It's not a real exception, but partial. But none ever had caused the disease only after antibodies appeared, which is how AIDS is defined. None. Every eighth grade biology student should question why this basic fact of science has been turned upside down with HIV. The taxpayer should ask why we've spent 12 years and billions of dollars developing a vaccine against HIV when the best vaccine possible already exists when an individual tests positive. Reason number two. HIV does not kill the T-cells it infects. AIDS patients are losing T-cells, and because these are the cells HIV infects, it was assumed that HIV was killing them. But only under rare laboratory conditions do retroviruses kill their host cells. In fact, Robert Gallo and other AIDS researchers use T-cells to grow the virus because T-cells live quite compatibly with HIV. 
This claim that a retrovirus was killing T cells was what sparked Peter Duesberg's suspicions based on his experience with retroviruses in cancer research. And here Gallo comes along and says, well, HIV is causing AIDS by killing T cells. When the T cells are killed, the immune deficient and efficiency produces AIDS. That didn't seem to fit with everything we ever learned about retroviruses and knew about retroviruses, namely that retroviruses do not kill cells. Retroviruses are set apart from virtually all other animal viruses we know, human and animal viruses, in that they do not kill the cell they infect, ever. They're not killer viruses. That's why they are at least possible cancer viruses causing a disease. A virus that could cause a cancer a disease would be one that couldn't kill a cell. If it killed the cell, there wouldn't be a cancer. Reason number three, HIV does not infect enough T cells to cause AIDS. Even if HIV killed the T cells it infects, it does not infect enough cells to cause AIDS. Shortly after HIV is brought under control by the antibody defense, the billions of virus particles become dormant and begin to disappear. Before long, the virus can hardly be found in T cell at all, infecting only one cell out of every 1,000 and sometimes as few as one cell out of every 100,000. On the other hand, T cells can reproduce at the rate of 5% a day. Simple math proves that HIV cannot infect enough T cells to cause them to die off and bring down the entire immune system. Even supporters of HIV admit that this low amount of T cell infection is a challenge to explain. AIDS patients are characterized by the deficiency or depletion of T cells. They lack T cells, that's why they are AIDS patients. But when the first data appeared, in fact, many from Gallo's, the first real good data on that came from Gallo's lab. The surprising news was there was no virus found in T cells, practically none. In fact, the notorious difficulties of our nation's leading, at that time, leading AIDS researcher, Robert Gallo, in finding the virus led him to his you know, well-known prob problems with uh, st essentially appropriating or misappropriating, speak stealing the virus from Montagnier. He couldn't isolate the virus because there was no virus there, not because he's incompetent, simply he confirmed what we are just talking about, there is no virus in AIDS patients, only antibodies against it. So if one in 1,000 cells or even one in 100 cells is infected by a virus, you won't get a disease from it, you won't die from it. In order to die from a depletion of T cells, you would need to have a virus that kills more than half of them. It's, it's like saying you're dying, you're a 25-year-old man suffering a, a fatal disease or dying from a fatal disease because you stuck yourself with a needle or cut yourself while shaving. You're losing about one hundredth or thousands of your blood with a bad cut and shaving. You're not going to die from that. But that's what Gallo's hypothesis actually said. Reason number four, HIV has no AIDS-causing gene. HIV has no specific gene or unique genetic reason to cause AIDS. All retroviruses have only three major genes, GAG, ENF, and PAL, and only six minor genes. Because the genes and genetic sequences are so limited in these very simple little viruses, they need all the genes to replicate. HIV is almost identical to all other retroviruses genetically. What most people do not know is that there are as many as 50 to 100 of these retroviruses that can be found in every healthy human body. All of them through genes, and all are kept under control by antibodies after infection. HIV behaves no differently than the others in the way that it mutates, becomes dormant, and reactivates. So the question is, if none of these other retroviruses cause diseases, why should HIV? Or vice versa, if HIV causes AIDS, why don't all the rest? So, there's no genetic reason to explain why HIV would cause AIDS. Number five, there is no such thing as a slow virus. HIV is said to be a slow virus that takes 10 to 12 years after infection to cause AIDS. The only way to explain this is to give HIV magical abilities to reactivate, mutate, migrate, and hibernate. These slow virus hypotheses were devised by scientists like Gadusek and Gallo, who used them to buy time when their disease-causing agent failed to perform. They based their slow virus hypotheses on studies of Epstein-Barr, 
which was supposed to cause a cancer 10 years after infection, and herpes viruses that hide and reemerge in persons who have suppressed immunity and can't generate a sufficient defense. But these differ greatly from HIV, because in both cases, large amounts of active virus can be found, causing specific symptoms. In total contrast, HIV is inactive, then is said to cause 30 different diseases 10 years later, none of which are specific to HIV itself. Peter Duisberg says, there's no such thing as a slow virus, only slow virologists. A virus, including a retrovirus, causes a disease within days, weeks, or at the very most, a month after infection. And that is not a mysterious number. That number is a direct function of the generation time of the virus, the time a virus needs to infect a cell and generate new virus particles. And that takes with all viruses we know of in humans, all of them, including HIV and including all retroviruses, at the very most, one or two or three weeks. So whatever a virus could possibly do has to happen in that time period or else it's not caused by that virus. And with AIDS, everybody, even from the very beginning, talked about a so-called minimal latent period of, or average latent period of one year, and now they have raised that to 10 years. In other words, we are buying lots and lots of time for something else to cause the disease that is in fact blamed on that virus. There is not in 12 years of research, 35 billion by the American taxpayer alone, not to mention private organizations and companies and other countries, there is not even a shred of light on this question, why it would take 10 years from the infection to a disease. In fact, it's impossible. Reason number six, HIV is not a new virus, so HIV would not suddenly cause a new epidemic. AIDS cases have increased dramatically from zero in 1980 to half a million by 1996. So researchers assumed that it could only be caused by a new virus spreading quickly into the population. An old virus would have caused an AIDS epidemic years ago, possibly even centuries ago. So HIV must be a new infection to cause the recent AIDS epidemic. But here again, the HIV AIDS proponents bypassed yet another essential question of logic. How old is HIV and where did it come from? Theories about green monkey bites and traveling gay flight attendants run in the headlines, but no one in the government-funded research program has bothered to verify the age of HIV. Peter Duisberg says HIV is very old, using the fundamental means of dating viruses found in Farr's law. Farr was a British epidemiologist, William Farr, in the Earth's first part of the 19th century, who noted when a new epidemic comes into a population like AIDS is said to be new or the virus causing it is said to be new as well and that it spreads exponentially in that population translated into current tabloid newspaper reporting it explodes into that population like a seasonal flu epidemic that's what Farr's law says but if a microbe and a disease is long established then it's old. So when you look at HIV in America, you'll find ever since it can be detected, one million Americans are positive. That was first reported by the Centers for Disease Control in 1985 and has since been repeated over and over and over every 10, every year for 10 years, 11 years now, almost 12 years now. So if it's in one million Americans for 10 years, year, every single year, that can't be no. And those statistics are harder than we, anything we ever had in microbiology. 25 million Americans are tested once a year, it's 10%. A Gallup poll is usually on the, within a percentile when you test 10,000 Americans, or 5,000 they call them by phone, and they get it within a percentage accuracy. This is done on 25 million people for 10 years. Nothing has ever been checked so carefully. That's an extremely hard number. This thing is age is old. This virus is in America is older than America. It came in with the immigrants. That's older than the Constitution. So HIV is not a new virus, and many of the people who have antibodies to it got it perinatally or from their mothers, not from dirty needles or unsafe sex, and have lived full healthy lives for centuries without AIDS. Number seven, HIV fails Cox postulates. 
The universal test used by scientists to determine if a disease is truly being caused by an infection was designed over 100 years ago by Robert Koch, who discovered the bacteria that causes TB. HIV fails this test. Koch's postulates state, first, the virus or bacteria must be found in all cases of the disease. Second, this germ must be isolated from the infected host and grown in a pure culture. Third, the germ must cause the same disease and injected into a new healthy host. And finally, the germ must be found growing again in the newly diseased host. HIV fails postulate number one because 10 to 20 percent of all AIDS patients have no HIV at all. When HIV can be found, it is only in very small amounts and usually dormant. HIV passes postulate number two only on a technicality. It can be isolated, but it takes huge amounts of cell tissue to find it. Then a difficult chemically induced process is needed to reactivate the virus. By contrast, large amounts of active virus can easily be found with other diseases. HIV fails postulate three hands down. HIV does not cause AIDS when injected into test animals like chimpanzees. And more importantly, human health care workers accidentally infected with HIV rarely get AIDS unless they use drugs and AZT. Robert Gallo and the HIV orthodoxy have dismissed Cox postulates as old and out of date with modern medicine. But the postulates have stood the test of time, and scientists who have ignored and bypassed them have done so at their own peril. Time after time, with diseases like scurvy, beriberi, pellagra, smon, and even the failed virus cancer program, all ignored Cox postulates and all proved to be non-infectious. All efforts to find infectious causes ended in a dismal failure, and now, HIV and AIDS? It's obvious that HIV fails to cause AIDS beneath the microscopic lens and on the drawing board, but it doesn't fly in the population studies either. When we use the telescopic lens to observe the population at large, HIV's failure comes linked to real names and faces. The population studies prove beyond a doubt that HIV does not cause AIDS. Number eight, AIDS has remained in its original risk groups for over 12 years. When an infectious epidemic strikes, it begins in small clusters, then quickly spreads throughout the entire population. If a disease does not spread, it is not contagious and must be caused by something non-infectious. Figures compiled to Centers for Disease Control confirm that AIDS is not spreading into the population at large and is locked in its original risk groups. Homosexual males, IV drug users, hemophiliacs, and blood transfusion patients make up 97% of all AIDS patients and have continued at that rate for over 10 years. The remaining 3% of AIDS patients outside these risk groups are made up of persons who suffer from immunodeficiency at random and just happen to be infected with HIV. If AIDS is truly being caused by a virus, the patients who do not fit into these risk groups would be growing above the 3% as the disease spread. But AIDS has failed to spread into the female population also. When the U.S. Army began testing new recruits for HIV in 1984, they discovered an amazing fact. HIV infection was evenly spread between males and females 50-50, and it's remained that way since then. It should follow that AIDS would be 50% male and 50% female. Yet 9 out of every 10 people who develop AIDS continue to be male. A germ-related disease should be spread evenly between the sexes. And though HIV is evenly spread, 90% of all U.S. AIDS cases develop only in males. This could explain why drug use is more related to AIDS than HIV infection. In the U.S., males use over 80% of all hard psychoactive drugs. And among the women with AIDS, over half use IV drugs also. In times past, every infectious disease has taken its toll on doctors, nurses, healthcare workers who work with the infected. Yet AIDS has failed to spread here as well. With over 500,000 cases of AIDS, hardly one physician has developed AIDS as a result of an occupational HIV infection. In healthcare workers and laboratory technicians who cultivate high amounts of active HIV, there have been hundreds of confirmed accidental exposures and infections. Yet within the field of five million healthcare workers, only a handful of cases of AIDS have been reported, and even these are highly diluted. From the statistics generated by this vast population study, it becomes evident AIDS is more related to behavior and specific medical risks than it is to HIV infection. Even supporters of HIV concede AIDS is not becoming the world pandemic that was predicted. 
Reason number nine, international comparison of AIDS differ greatly. A germ-related disease would affect a population in the same way around the world. For example, an outbreak of cholera in India would be similar to an outbreak in Honduras. But AIDS statistics are totally different in the U.S. and Western industrialized nations compared to Africa. In the U.S., AIDS patients are 90% male, but in Africa, AIDS is evenly spread between the sexes. In the U.S., AIDS resides among risk groups at the rate of 97%. Yet in Africa, AIDS has no risk groups and is found at random in the general population. Only 62% of the AIDS diseases in the U.S. are microbial, but in Africa, that number is approximately 90%. Likewise, the AIDS diseases in the U.S. that are not germ-related make up 38% of the total, a number that does not correlate with Africa at only 10%. HIV is believed to have originated in Africa where an estimated 14 million have the virus. Because of malnutrition and other health conditions conducive to AIDS, statistics from Africa should be at least 14 times higher than in the U.S. Yet surprisingly, it's quite the opposite. People infected with HIV in the U.S. develop AIDS at a rate 10 to 20 times faster than Africans. Figures from the CDC and the World Health Organization have confirmed this since 1987 through 1995. So the question is, why would the AIDS epidemic behave so differently in the industrialized world? One good explanation is that HIV does not cause AIDS, and the real causes are hard psychoactive drugs used primarily in the U.S. and Europe. Duisburg questions if what is being called AIDS in Africa is really the same epidemic. But the African epidemic, I think, is a completely different epidemic. It um, affects men and women alike. In, in America, AIDS is 90% men, and in Europe, 90% men. That's epidemiologically as different as day and night. 50% compared to 90% is completely different. That's a totally different epidemic, the African one. And the diseases, likewise, are very different in the two continents. So clinically and epidemiolo epidemiologically, the two epidemics are very different. And in Africa, it's um, possibly malnutrition, parasitic infection, and poor sanitation. It affects, there are no risk groups. There's not homosexuals or intravenous drug users. It's just poor people without running water, without supermarkets, without doctors. The London Sunday Times questions whether AIDS in Africa is a myth. Quoting Dr. Kohutni Ohulu, if tens of thousands are dying of AIDS in Africa, where are their graves? Well, one of, our, one of the members of our group is a fellow called Philippe Kreine, who is uh, there in, uh, up there in Tanzania, uh, Tanzania um, which is thought to be the epicenter of the AIDS um, outbreak. And uh, there he and his wife, um, Evelyn, uh, went uh, to tr deal with orphans with AIDS. They're kind of well-to-do French uh, do-gooders who, by the way, got quite a lot of money from France, I'm told, and who popularized the idea of AIDS in Africa. Well, after being on the ground there in Tanzania for a couple of years, he reported that after the, all this time, we have to conclude that there is no AIDS and there are no orphans. The people that were thought to be orphans were actually being taken care of by their grandparents while their own parents were off in Dar es Salaam making money. They came back at the end of the dry season or something like that. It's, a, it's an amazing story. The, um, the, the AIDS diseases that these people were suffering from were just the same old diseases that everybody was suffering from in Africa from, from time immemorial. The only difference now is that if it was called an AIDS disease, then WHO and uh, the United Nations send money. If, you, if it's called a diarrhea, What's new about a diarrhea in Africa? But if it's an AIDS diarrhea, uh, well, then the United States sends money. Finally, reason number 10. AIDS occurs without HIV infection, and most people with HIV never develop AIDS. The evidence in support of the HIV hypothesis based solely on correlation. Because the virus is often found in most AIDS patients, we have assumed HIV is causing AIDS. But the logic of that assumption is flawed because correlation does not prove causation. For example, the presence of HIV in AIDS patients is no more proof of the cause than the presence of birds on power lines prove that the birds cause power failures. They only correlate. 
So if HIV is a harmless passenger virus that only correlates with other real causes of AIDS, we should expect to see two things. People with, who are not infected with HIV and HIV infected people who are healthy and do not get AIDS. And that is exactly what is happening. What's also important is that different risk groups develop different diseases. Why would HIV supposedly cause one set of diseases in IV drug users and another set in homosexual males? Unless HIV is not the cause and other causes are at work. Do we find these specific AIDS diseases in the risk groups among persons who do not have the virus? The answer is definitely yes. Diseases like Kaposi sarcoma and advanced cytomegalovirus, which strike primarily gay males, have been found in numerous homosexual men who do not have HIV. But these men have one common denominator, the use of nitrite inhalants as aphrodisiacs that are known to be immunosuppressive. Thousands of American drug addicts who are not infected with HIV get the same tuberculosis, wasting syndrome, and pneumonias, and even lose the same CD4 T cells as those who are HIV positive. The slow death that resembles AIDS in heroin addicts has been observed and documented in the medical literature since 1898. So in these two risk groups that comprise over 90% of US AIDS cases, there are other factors at work that could cause AIDS and have for years. Peter Duesberg says there are 4,621 documented AIDS cases without HIV. And this number is much lower than it may actually be. 4,621. So that was in 93. In the meantime, I could probably easily get this number over 5,000. But the number isn't growing as fast as it could or should, because if a person is reported with a clinical AIDS diagnosis and is HIV negative, he or she will not appear in, in national AIDS statistics. They will say, oh, it's Kaposi, that's not AIDS. It's pneumonia or pneumocystis pneumonia. It's not AIDS because it's not HIV positive. And people are, I mean, I know, in fact, people are examples of people who told me under condition of anonymity, they had observed this in Stanford and in San Francisco, the public health, and were pressured not to publish this simply not to mention it. Or if they published it, not in an AIDS journal and under an AIDS listing. The same thing is happening in, in England and everywhere else. So these cases mostly date from the early days on HIV and AIDS in the, in the 80s and early 90s, when people were still genuinely asking, is HIV actually found in all AIDS cases? And they reported actually 4,621 cases that I could easily find of AIDS diagnosis in the absence of HIV. And more have accumulated since, but not as many, because people know now what to say and what not to say in order to survive in, in this competitive world. The official definition of AIDS is designed to eliminate every case of AIDS that presents an embarrassing non-correlation against HIV. The official definition of AIDS is 30 previously known all diseases in the presence of antibody against HIV. So if you have Kaposi sarcoma and HIV antibodies, you're an AIDS patient. Without it, you're a Kaposi patient. K a pneumonia with HIV antibodies is AIDS. In the absence is pneumonia. Dementia in the absence of HIV antibodies is dementia. And with it, it's AIDS. That's the AIDS definition. There is no HIV-specific disease anywhere, unlike any other microbe that causes a specific C disease, just like an instrument makes a specific sound. HIV doesn't make a specific sound. It causes, is said to cause, 30 previously known diseases when it's there. And when it's not there, the original causes of these diseases are responsible for them. <laughs> that is the official definition of AIDS, not my joke. Using this official definition, HIV proponents arrive at a near 100% correlation between the virus and AIDS. And remember, the HIV hypothesis is based solely on correlational evidence. And you can find a correlation, there's no question about it. If you ignore all the cases where there isn't a correlation, you have a correlation. But that is, that's, that is, um, that's a very bad science, and it's very bad epidemiology as well. Critics say this correlation is not objective or scientific, and deceptively self-fulfilling. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, yes. And science is designed to, uh, to, uh, to get around self-fulfilling prophecies, but in this case, it's, uh, it's proceeding on the basis of one. 
Finally, the most convincing argument against HIV, the millions of people worldwide who have the virus and are not becoming sick. This is very apparent in Africa, where 97% of those with HIV are healthy and do not have AIDS. Documented AIDS cases amount to only 3%. Also in the U.S., where only half a million infected have progressed to full-blown AIDS over a 15-year latency period. And this figure does not account for the 19 new diseases defined by the CDC as AIDS and 62,000 AIDS patients who were never tested for the virus. It is evident HIV does not cause AIDS in most people, and this evidence becomes stronger every year. Robert Gallo, Anthony Fauci, and the entire scientific and political campaign based on HIV are in serious, serious trouble. And as the foundation of the scientific support for this multi-billion dollar hypothesis crumbles, the real causes of AIDS will continue to take hundreds of thousands of lives. Yet the hollow campaign goes on and on like a broken record. We have a long way to go in the fight against HIV. The virus that causes AIDS. 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 Then what could be the real causes of AIDS? There is no question about the reality of people dying. But if HIV is not the cause, what is? And what can we do to stop it? Under the protocol of scientific debate, Dr. Peter Duisberg and the group for reappraising AIDS are not required to solve the problem simply because they dispute the HIV hypothesis, but they have made some suggestions. To begin with, Duisberg argues that AIDS is not infectious, it is not being spread sexually, and it is not a threat to the public at large. He and journalist John Lawrenson have proposed that AIDS is caused by recreational drug use and AZT psychic drugs used by homosexuals as aphrodisiacs and injected drugs like heroin and cocaine they claim are the direct cause of AIDS in nine out of ten cases. AIDS has come from virtually nowhere or from a very low basis up to now currently 80 ninety thousand cases per year in this country. So here's it is my curve. AIDS has gone up in the last uh, 14, 15 years from uh, virtually nothing that used to be called that way. There was always a low background of these diseases. None of the AIDS diseases is new. To up to 100,000 in 93, and now it's topping down to 80,000 uh, last year. But HIV has been unchanging 1 million. So this could not ever be the cause of this. This is going up from nowhere to 100,000, and this is staying a million for 10 years. How can this cause this? But if you look at this here, this shows you how cocaine use and heroin goes up. This is cocaine and this is heroin, and this is cocaine-related hospital emergencies. You will see that these two match pretty well. And that's what we discussed earlier. That's the lifestyle hypothesis or the drug hypothesis that recreational drugs are causing these diseases. And they, they uh, match perfectly over time. They track perfectly the drug use, the drug use emergencies, heroin, cocaine in this case, and AIDS, but not HIV. The correlation between AIDS and skyrocketing drug use is astounding. And unlike HIV, we have a good idea of how drugs suppress the immune system. Well, how does smoking cause emphysema? How does alcoholism cause liver cirrhosis? That is something that has been described in the literature. It's chemistry. You know? Chemicals have their price. You can't expect to take chemical at a dose that gets you so high that you don't sleep anymore, you don't want to eat anymore, have 10 or 20 sex partners per night, to expect to be totally inconsequential for your health. If you do so much chemistry, put you so much chemistry in your body and do it with your body, you cannot expect that this has no consequences. It's like hoping that you can drive an American freeway car designed to go 60 miles an hour and 160 miles and expect it to run just as long as the company has promised uh, it would last. Though there are no government-funded studies that examine the long-term effects of drug use in this war on AIDS, the medical literature is full of cases of AIDS-like symptoms among drug addicts. Since 1909, we've observed the horrendous effects of heroin, morphine, speed, 
cocaine, and other injected drugs on the immune system. Today, thousands of American junkies who are not infected with HIV are losing the same CD4 T cells and getting the same diseases as AIDS patients. How has the war on AIDS addressed this issue? We've passed out clean needles and told addicts to avoid getting HIV. IV drug users comprise over 32% of all U.S. AIDS cases. Approximately 62% of all the women with AIDS are IV drug users, and 70% of the babies born with AIDS are born to mothers addicted to drugs. But the largest risk group is male homosexuals. Well over half, that's 60% of all AIDS patients are gay men. What is causing AIDS in homosexuals, and are they all at risk? Here again, Peter Duesberg argues that AIDS is not infectious and is really the result of drugs used by many men in the fast-track gay lifestyle. Surveys conducted by the CDC show that gays often indulge in a high amount of recreational drug use, including many of the drugs known to be immunosuppressive in drug addicts. But one drug that was available legally, nitrite inhalants, commonly known as poppers, are used extensively. Poppers are believed to be the direct cause of Kaposi's sarcoma, a rare form of skin cancer that afflicts the nose, throat, lungs, and skin. Kaposi's sarcoma has been an indicator disease of AIDS, but it is often found in gay men who are not infected with HIV. In a study published by Toby Eisenstein, rodents showed an immediated dose response in immune suppression after being exposed to nitrites found in poppers. Oh, I think that's very revealing. Uh, it showed that NO, nitric oxide radical, is terribly immunosuppressive. But interestingly enough, all of the literature on NO, and I follow, follow it rather carefully at, uh, by computer, never mentions amyl butyl nitrite, never mentions the word poppers. It's as almost these two worlds are living side by side, but they don't, are not talking to each other. Another possible cause of AIDS among homosexuals and heterosexuals as well is the infection that occurs during anal sex. The tissue lining in the rectum is permeable and only one layer thick. Unlike the vagina, which is three layers thick, the rectum cannot accommodate the abrasive thrusting that takes place during anal sex. Through the tears in this lining, foreign proteins found in semen along with viruses and bacteria have a direct route to the blood. Contamination from feces and bacteria have been blamed for what is called gay bowel syndrome, where the colon and rectum become inflamed, accompanied by diarrhea, loss of bowel control, and malnutrition. Also, foreign proteins found in sperm have been shown to be immunosuppressive. It's been suggested that when they enter the blood, they could trigger an autoimmune reaction where the body's immune system turns upon itself. Small cuts and sores on the penis are routes by which infection spreads to the person on the giving end. Using a condom during anal sex can reduce the risk of foreign proteins infecting the blood, but often the condom, even when it works properly, still tears the rectal lining and exposes the recipient to chemicals used as lubricants. Many gay AIDS patients have multiple infections of gonorrhea, syphilis, hepatitis, herpes, cytomegalovirus, and other diseases. To combat these repeated infections, homosexuals often take huge amounts of antibiotics during bathhouse visits, along with other drugs. These antibiotic overdoses also wear down the immune system. There's no doubt that homosexuals are contracting many of these opportunistic AIDS diseases sexually. But is this the cause of AIDS? Or simply put, are gays getting AIDS because of homosexual behavior? Or is it caused by drugs used commonly in connection with the gay lifestyle? Peter Duesberg points out that the number of homosexuals getting AIDS amounts to only a very small percentage of the entire gay population. So we're talking about a very small percentage of the homosexual population that is that is, that is practicing this lifestyle, taking these drugs for sex. Those are the ones who are at risk, not homosexuals. Homosexuals, again, are as old as mankind is. Uh, Michelangelo was, Socrates was, Tchaikovsky was, and they all lived uh, without AIDS, normal lives. Duisberg argues that if the war on AIDS focused upon drugs used in the gay lifestyle instead of HIV, we could save thousands of lives. We have over 100,000 studies on HIV and AIDS. And there isn't one, there is not uno epidemiological study that has shown that a group of, I go as low as 10 or 20 men, homosexuals, heterosexual, doesn't matter, HIV positive, but not using poppers, 
not using cocaine, not using heroin, and not using AZT ever gets AIDS. Ever gets Kaposi sarcoma, tuberculosis, dementia, or diarrhea at the age of 25 or 35, where these men die when they take the drugs and have HIV. Why is there no such study? I think the answer is very simple, because HIV doesn't do it. It's the drugs that are doing it. So if recreational drug use can explain 9 out of 10 AIDS cases among homosexuals and drug addicts, what the other 10%, such as people with medical risks like blood transfusion patients and hemophiliacs? The risk in receiving blood is well known, and it should be no surprise that transfusion patients often develop AIDS symptoms. Because of the life-threatening conditions that require transfusions, almost 50% of all transfusion patients die within a year after receiving blood. In those that survive, their immunosuppression directly corresponds with how much blood they receive, the condition of their illness, and factors affecting their health regardless of whether they are infected with HIV. Hemophiliacs receive injections of blood clotting factor 8 made from thousands of blood donors. Before blood was tested for HIV, many were infected with the virus and some developed AIDS. Yet some of the most revealing contradictions against HIV can be observed among this special group. For years, Dr. Duesberg has argued that HIV is not causing AIDS in hemophiliacs, and his research indicates what is. Foreign proteins found in clotting factor 8 that can be shown to have a measured dose response towards suppressing immunity in hemophiliacs. Almost 75% of American hemophiliacs are infected with HIV, yet the lifespan of hemophiliacs as a group has increased by 15 years during the AIDS epidemic. So, hemophiliacs are living longer than ever before in history with HIV. In fact, hemophiliacs with HIV develop AIDS at a slower rate than IV drug users and homosexuals. A recent study conducted by Sarah Darby at Oxford death rates among British hemophiliacs between 1977 through 1992. The Darby study concluded that HIV-infected hemophiliacs were dying at a much faster rate, which supports the HIV hypothesis. But under scrutiny, the Darby study falls apart. The trouble is with the Darby experiment is that they did not control for the magnitude and uh, amount of foreign proteins that were being received by these hemophiliacs. So, it's impossible to determine whether HIV or foreign proteins in factor 8 are increasing the death rates. Since HIV rarely contaminates factor 8, those hemophiliacs infected with the virus would have the highest number of infusions of the factor and should be expected to develop AIDS faster. But the most alarming observation about Darby's study delivers a crowning blow to the HIV hypothesis, followed by a frightening realization. The data clearly indicates that the HIV hypothesis itself is causing AIDS. Look closely at the death rates. Even though many hemophiliacs had been infected with HIV for years before it could be detected, their mortality rate remained low. But when HIV testing was introduced in 1985, it suddenly jumped. The question is, why would someone living with HIV only start to die after being told they were infected unless the virus is harmless? and it can only cause AIDS when a patient is terrorized by a diagnosis of death and begins taking deadly antiviral treatments like AZT that could cause AIDS themselves. The Darby study scientifically documents the HIV AIDS formula for mass medical disaster, a failed hypothesis that spawns a misdiagnosis of death and terrorizes the unwary into taking deadly treatments that cause the theoretical disease, a self-fulfilling epitaph HIV causes AIDS. AZT, AIDS by prescription. In 1987, the war on AIDS took another drastic turn for the worse. AZT, a toxic chemotherapy deemed too poisonous for cancer treatment, was approved to treat symptomatic and asymptomatic HIV patients in an attempt to kill the virus that causes AIDS. AZT is a DNA chain terminator a poison designed to randomly destroy the DNA synthesis of reproducing cells. It was initially developed to treat leukemia victims, but after animal testing, the FDA determined that it was too toxic for use in human beings and banned it. But in 1987, when the AIDS scare hit its height, the FDA was pressured into approving the drug for use for the first time in human beings, even for people who were healthy and showed no sign of AIDS. AZT is highly mutagenic, 
meaning that it destroys the genes in cells and has been shown to cause cancer in rodents. It targets the bone marrow where B lymphocyte blood cells are being made. These are the very cells an AIDS patient needs most for immunity. AZT destroys randomly bone marrow, kidneys, liver, intestines, muscle tissue, the brain, and central nervous system. Peter Duesberg claims AZT actually causes AIDS itself. AZT yes, does directly causing AIDS uh, defining diseases. You know, AIDS is a lot of the things, but it doesn't cause Kaposi's sarcoma, I think, but it does cause immunodeficiency. It was designed to do that. It was designed to kill human cells. In fact, the manufacturer says that uh, specifically that it can cause uh, AIDS -like diseases. And the manufacturer, that is Boris Welcome, says it is often difficult to distinguish adverse events possibly associated with cedovudin or cedovudin administration, which is ACT, from underlying signs of HIV disease. In other words, even they acknowledge, not just this book, that, CDV, uh, that AZT causes AIDS, or AIDS-defining diseases. In his book, Poison by Prescription, journalist John Lawrenson explains how DET tests conducted by the FDA and Burroughs Welcome, the manufacturer, were scientifically sloppy and outright fraudulent. During the experiments, patients taking AZT became anemic, suffered low white blood cell counts accompanied by vomiting. Over half had to have blood transfusions. 20% were transfused several times. Though both doctors and patients were not supposed to know who was getting AZT and who was getting the placebo, it became obvious halfway through the test who was on AZT. Out of fear and desperation, many of those being tested did drugs. The test was terminated early, and because of what appeared to be benefits from using AZT, the patients who were taking the placebo were now also given AZT. This made long-term follow-up of AZT's toxic effects impossible. Despite a warning by FDA toxicology analyst Harvey Chernoff that AZT not be approved, the FDA was pressured by AIDS activist organizations to lift the ban, and hundreds of thousands of people began taking AZT, even though AZT cannot cure AIDS and is only supposed to slow down the progression. But the logic behind AZT treatment is flawed, even if one believes HIV causes AIDS because HIV only infects about one T-cell in 1,000. 999 healthy T-cells must die to kill the one cell that is infected. And this can only happen early on before HIV becomes dormant and is still making DNA. Yet AIDS patients are given AZT for months on into years, randomly destroying DNA in all parts of the body. AZT is expensive and costs between $8,000 and $12,000 a year most of which is paid for directly or indirectly by the taxpayer. Burroughs Welcome, now Glaxo Welcome, the manufacturer, has generated sales over $1 billion a year with AZT. Because of rules allowed by the FDA, a bottle of AZT that costs about $5 to make can be sold for over $500 as a prescription, and much of this markup is being subsidized by the taxpayer. There's no question that destroying DNA is lucrative, but what good, if any, does AZT really do? Patients who begin taking AZT show an immediate increase in T cells. And because it is assumed that HIV is killing those cells, AZT is assumed to be slowing down the virus that causes AIDS. Dr. Charles Thomas explains why this short-term effect is dangerously misleading. All toxic substances elicit a response, a positive response. Uh, for a while. For example, you can give people low levels of strain and they suddenly become a little bit healthier, a little bit, uh, a little bit stronger before they, uh, higher doses would, uh, would kill them. Radiation, for example, causes a lengthening. Low doses of radiation causes a lengthening of the lifespan of rodents. Lo a low doses of methylene chloride, ethylene chloride, will also elongate the lifetime of rodents. Higher doses, of course, will kill them. So when you start on AZT, uh, you're killing off your bone marrow, and the blood system notices a defect in red cells and other blood cells and sends out a signal, overproduce as long as you can. And for a while then, people start producing more than they did prior to the treatment. But as you kill off the sources from where it comes, you very soon uh, bring it down to below where they started from and ultimately pretty soon to death. So within a year or two, most people on ACT are gone, They're killed off.
from the ACT. Some last longer and some last shorter, depending on how sensitive they are to the drug. Peter Duesberg cites Kimberly Bergalis, the young woman supposedly infected by her dentist with HIV, as actually an AZT victim. Before she was treated with AZT, her only problem was a yeast infection common to many women. She became sick when she was treated with AZT. And she got all the symptoms that you would predict from AZT. She lost weight and she uh, became anemic, lost her hair and couldn't walk and died on a wheelchair a year later after treatment with ACT. I did nothing wrong, yet I'm being made to suffer like this. My life has been taken away. Is this AIDS, or is it AZT poisoning? Approximately 200,000 people are currently being treated with drugs like AZT worldwide, many who are not sick and have no AIDS symptoms at all. Studies have shown that physicians are less likely to question authority than other professionals, as long as the American Medical Association and the U.S. Department of Health back HIV, they'll follow suit. The shocking fact is, if HIV does not cause AIDS and AZT is actually killing their patients, the average doctor will be the last to know. Uh, I think that uh, it's enormous cruelty uh, in, in feeding people AZT. Certainly, it's not a good way to kill HIV. And besides, why do you want to kill HIV? when it hasn't been shown to cause AIDS. Recent studies on AZT's long-term effects are confirming Jim Lawrence's suspicions. The International AIDS Conference in Berlin announced that AZT was ineffective in preventing AIDS among non-symptomatic HIV positives. In spite of all of this, AIDS industry drug promoters like Margaret Fissel continue to encourage early treatment of what they call HIV disease with highly toxic drugs like AZT. And as if the lives of homosexuals, IV drug users, and those with medical risks are not enough, Fissel and the others are now calling for pregnant women and innocent babies to be sacrificed on the altar to HIV. Tremendous pressure is placed on pregnant women to be tested for the virus and treated with AZT if they're found to be antibody positive. Many are calling this retroactive abortion, and this time they're killing the mother too. Here in, in, uh, in, in pregnancy, one of the hardest tools was not for mothers to take anything that is mutagenic during pregnancy, not even an American beer, which contains a few percent of alcohol. Ever since the sal salinomide crisis in the 50s, where we had all these birth defects as a result of that drug that is a tranquilizer, a German tranquilizer it was in Europe, that produced all these salinomide babies, uh, we have ever uh, accepted any, mutagen uh, any mutagenic substance in pregnant women again. And now we're allowing even AZT in pregnant women, and I think it's a nightmare. I, I'm at a loss for words for this. Yeah. I can't believe that this is happening in this country that prides itself of being so advanced and so progressive and so knowledgeable about biology. Putting AZT on a daily basis in a pregnant mother and a baby is beyond me. Yeah. Babies born to HIV-infected mothers will initially test HIV positive. But within a year, 50 to 90 percent develop their own immune systems and become HIV negative. Even if one believes that HIV causes AIDS, there is no rational reason to expose all pregnant mothers and infants to AZT to only slightly reduce the chance of HIV infection, ultimately found in only two out of ten babies. Is AZT more damaging to a growing baby than a full-grown adult? Well, I would say yes. I think once you're fully developed, you are less susceptible to damage from a terminator of DNA synthesis because everything is, is cone, it's there already. Uh, but in a developing baby or fetus where everything is going, uh, you, you're damaging randomly the brain and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the bones and the lungs and the kidneys, everything is at risk for termination of DNA synthesis. It's, uh, I, I don't understand it, that this is, can happen in this country. Mothers who refuse to take AZT and resist giving it to their baby could find their physician reporting them to social services who could take the child away and force treatment. This is actually happening in some cases. Cheryl and Steve Nagel know this firsthand. Lindsay, their adopted daughter from Romania, had to be tested for HIV upon entering the U.S. She tested positive and was put on AZT. 
The Nagels became concerned after Lindsay would continually wake up at night screaming about pain burning in her legs. After contacting Peter Duesberg, they took his advice and got her off AZT, and the problems went away. But their physician has contested this decision and tried various ways to coerce them into continuing the AZT treatment. Lindsay is now doing just fine, but meanwhile, other children from her group who continued on AZT have long since died. Lawsuits against Glaxo Welcome and treating physicians are beginning to abound, especially in cases where the HIV test produces a false positive. The federal government cannot be sued and is immune to responsibility for creating a mass misdiagnosis based on HIV. But how about the pharmaceutical giants that claim their drug prolongs life? They are responsible for very, very uh, misleading, crooked, fraudulent tests. And I think they deserve everything that's coming to them. I think it, uh, they have a great deal of culpability. And um, I think they should shoulder that culpability and make it right. What about the new drugs that claim to be an improvement, like DDI and DDC? DDI, DDC is exactly like AZT. It's just another one of those chain terminators. There are four in theory that you can design and they are just analogs of the four nucleotides of DNA. The newest form of treatment produced by the AIDS industry are the protease inhibitors designed to prevent the virus from detaching itself from a cell and going on to reproduce. In the true fashion of everything done in the war on AIDS, the benefits of these drugs are often announced at a press conference without outside critique or long-term review. The most recent one was approved by the FDA in a record 42 days. All this to fight a virus that is dormant and not reproducing. I have never seen a study that showed any clinical benefits whatsoever. I'm saying whatsoever of this protein. Though the news media has bolstered reports of these new miracle drugs with high acclaim, valid clinical benefits are scarce and disappointing. In one long-term study, 400 AIDS patients taking protease inhibitors showed no improvement over those not on the treatment. Patients who claim to be having a miraculous recovery could actually be experiencing a psychologically induced placebo effect, and in other cases, improved health could be due to cutbacks and dosages of much more toxic drugs like AZT. Many patients experience short-term recoveries followed by a swift crash that often results in death. Dr. David Rasnick has studied protease inhibitors for 20 years. He says, quote, the HIV protease inhibitors are extremely effective at preventing the production of infectious virus in vitro. Rasnick says that because the protease inhibitors are so effective at stopping HIV, only a small amount would be needed to stop a real viral disease. But AIDS patients are prescribed huge dosages over long periods of time on regimented schedules in an attempt to completely eliminate any trace of HIV from their system. Over time, side effects of the protease inhibitors have caused problems with blood clotting, liver function, digestion, and even kidney stones. So why aren't AIDS patients getting any better? The success of the protease inhibitors spells another failure for the HIV hypothesis. We have finally found a way to stop the virus and it's having no effect on stopping AIDS. How do the drug companies explain this dilemma? With the same excuse used for AZT, that HIV is mutated to resist the treatment. But Rasnick says this is doubtful, quote, the well-publicized worry that HIV protease might mutate to inhibitor-resistant forms is not supported by the clinical data. Indeed, there are very good theoretical reasons confirmed by experiments that the inhibitor-resistant mutants of HIV protease do not lead to viable virus. This means that HIV is not escaping through mutation. So the HIV proponents who ignored fundamental science and common sense now face their biggest challenge yet finding a way to explain why stopping HIV does not stop AIDS. Until now, we're just trying to sell more drugs to people who are dying anyway, or helping them dying by these drugs. Tests are now being conducted on drug mixtures called cocktails, where DNA chain terminators like AZT are mixed with protease inhibitors and other strong drugs. These tests continually end prematurely, and the results are questionable. But the real question is, how fast will the market for these drugs evaporate if it's proven that HIV does not cause AIDS? 
It's obvious that the AIDS industry relies on the HIV hypothesis, but that might also work both ways, as one hand washes the other. HIV needs AZT to accomplish what statistics prove the virus can't do, that is, cause AIDS. How many AIDS patients have died because of treatment of AZT, and has AZT skewed statistics in favor of the HIV hypothesis? They have caused AIDS with AZT more than with HIV, and have thus, thus helped the myth that HIV is responsible for it. Whether real or only perceived as real, the fear of plague has been a useful tool in the hands of political opportunists down through history, and so it has been with HIV. Critics say what is called AIDS education is in reality a clever propaganda campaign designed to exploit the good intentions of the uninformed. Fear, which is based on several myths about HIV and AIDS, is what keeps the AIDS machine fed and keeps the money and support rolling in for government programs. The chief myth, of course, is that HIV causes AIDS and that virtually everyone infected with it will die. There has never been an infectious epidemic that is even close to being 100% fatal. Even the Black Death of Europe killed only one-third of the population, leaving the other two-thirds to repopulate the continent. According to figures from the World Health Organization, HIV cannot be proven to cause AIDS over nine times out of ten. Another myth concerns the accuracy of the HIV antibody blood test. Thousands of false positives occur due to malaria, flu, parasitic infections, and hormone changes during pregnancy. Studies now show that we've put too much at stake based on a test that can be dangerously odd. Christine Johnson has documented the reliability of the HIV blood test, and the inaccuracy of this test is frightening. In people who are not in the AIDS risk groups and who are not sick with an AIDS disease, the HIV antibody blood test can be wrong over 71% of the time. But the most socially terrorizing myth is that AIDS is spread sexually. HIV is spread by sharing needles and through sex with an infected person. Even if there is one encounter, one sexual encounter, Studies done at Harvard show that HIV is almost non-existent in sperm. 25 men with AIDS contributed about 1 million sperm cells each. Tests using highly sensitive detection methods could only find the footprint of one dormant HIV virus. The fact is, HIV is almost never spread sexually. CDC reports of heterosexual transmission ignore the possibility that these adults got HIV years ago from their mothers. This group also has a very high rate of false positives. But even HIV proponents admit its chances of being transmitted heterosexually are about one out of 1,000 encounters. The lovers and sexual partners of Magic Johnson, Arthur Ashe, Rock Hudson, and Liberace are all HIV negative, yet we're continually told that safe sex will stop AIDS. We've had a problem with young people not knowing about protecting themselves. The original projections of AIDS ravishing the nation as a sexually transmitted disease have fallen far short because they assumed that prostitutes would become infected and then pass HIV on to their clients who would then spread the virus throughout the entire population. But studies reveal that prostitutes almost never get HIV infections unless they also use drugs. Even in foreign countries where condoms are rarely used and prostitutes have over 100 sexual partners a week, HIV infection is virtually non-existent. Programs in schools and AIDS awareness centers that promote safe sex may be effective in preventing pregnancy and venereal diseases, but they've had no measurable effect in stopping AIDS. Still, the concept of a killer sex virus has proved to be the most effective tool in spreading the HIV AIDS propaganda and raising public funding. Everyone from Sunday school teachers to gay AIDS activists have dramatized the threat that AIDS can strike anyone through sex. Why are they intentionally terrorizing the population? In a very revealing examination of the government's AIDS program, the Wall Street Journal reported that the CDC knew way back in 1987 that HIV was not spreading sexually into the whole population, yet they continued to exaggerate the risk. CDC official Dr. Walter Dowdle went as far as to say, quote, 
As long as this was seen as a gay disease, or even worse, a disease of drug abusers, that pushed the disease way down the ladder. The public would never support a program to help a few people suffering from the effects of their recreational drug use. So AIDS had to become a disease, a disease everyone could get. Simply convince the masses they are threatened by a plague and they'll be glad to fund any means of stopping it. The incredible power of this terror tactic was realized early on by groups like the American Foundation for AIDS Research, AMFAR, Centers for Disease Control, who exploited it to raise billions of dollars. It was an easy ploy to sell and politically correct with gay activists. And then we had a huge lobby of gay men who were uh, politically vocal and demanded some action and some solution. Uh, they didn't want a lifestyle hypothesis, which was essentially the prevailing hypothesis in the early 80s as a cause of AIDS. That this was a consequence of their lifestyle, and lifestyle in turn was a euphemism for the enormous use of recreational drugs. Nitride inhalants, amphetamines, cocaine, and that's going on to this date. Although I, I would like to really make that clear that I'm far from claiming they are to be blamed for it. The people who are to be blamed for their successive drug use, as it has gone uh, developed in the last 20 years in this country, are really primarily the medical establishment again, more than the drug users, including the gay men, because they fail to warn people what the health cancer, the medical consequences are of long-term drug use. On the contrary, they in fact promote it to some way, in some way, by handing out clean needles and encouraging people to use clean needles. And they encourage them to use drugs. So I'm not blaming the users as they often you know, well, pigeonhole me and say you're a homophobe or you're against junkies or against your anti-libertarian and all this. So AIDS was transformed from a drug problem to a disease and it up big time. With a generous supply of taxpayers' dollars, the Centers for Disease Control could reinvest in HIV and that's just what they did grants and support from the government, along with tax-deductible gifts from the private sector, became available to any organization supporting HIV. And right behind the CDC came the pharmaceutical industry. Glaxo Welcome and Bristol Myers Squibb have provided hundreds of thousands of dollars to AIDS organizations to promote seminars on the benefits of using their drugs. Soon, even rebels like Martin Delaney, who were at one time critical of the use of AZT, reversed their position 180 degrees after receiving contributions from the pharmaceutical giants. Act up, fight back, fight AIDS. These leaders of the AIDS organizations are often seen at extravagant AIDS benefits with politicians and film stars who raise millions of tax-deductible dollars for the AIDS establishment. AIDS organizations have also become very active in the battle for gay rights because this appeals to homosexuals who join the group effort. That's because HIV provides gays with AIDS a scapegoat, a way out of accepting personal responsibility for their condition. This illusion is exploited by the AIDS establishment through their AIDS organizations who equate the war against AIDS with the struggle for gay rights. Through boycotts, newspaper editorials, and the mass media, AIDS organization leaders shift the blame of AIDS onto the straight community who aren't doing enough and somehow responsible for HIV taking thousands of lives. The fig leaf egalitarian philosophy behind HIV has become a political giant. Regardless of how one feels about gay rights, you have to wonder why money being spent to fight a disease goes to promoting the behavior so closely associated with the cause of that very disease. Are they really for gay rights, or are they using this to cultivate more AIDS patients? And as gays philosophically identify with the war against HIV, it becomes a politically correct means to their own self-destruction. Anyone who opposes the HIV mindset is labeled uncompassionate, homophobic, and a social menace. Even gay activists like Michael Callan and Sean Current, who have denounced HIV and treatments like AZT, soon find themselves ostracized by other homosexuals. The conservative right is also part of the plan. The CDC and the AIDS establishment have buttered both sides of the bread politically and support churches, community health centers, doctors and schools with HIV disinformation and in some cases government funding. One group in particular, Americans for a Sound AIDS Policy, is lobbying for mandatory HIV testing.
but scientists remain the most important group to control. Because money for research is handled by the National Institutes of Health, anyone who dares to challenge the HIV hypothesis risks losing their funding. Dr. Peter Duesberg was given the Outstanding Investigator Grant, the NIH's most prestigious award. But when he began presenting arguments against HIV, his funding was terminated. Yes, I had for 28 years, I had government cancer to research, and I lost them all since I questioned the HIV hypothesis. Mm. I, for one, have tried in the last two or three years, desperately, I've written 18 grant applications to study the effects of recreational drugs on cells in culture, on animals, or even on humans, if this were possible. Every one of these applications has been turned down. And if you, there's not one single study funded by the National Institute of Health or by the Department of Health and Human Studies, I say not one, not even uno, that studies the long-term effect of these drugs on, the, on health. The amount of funding going into HIV AIDS research is tremendously disproportional to the masses afflicted with other diseases. AIDS patients get $15 of government funding for every $1 spent on patients with cancer, heart disease, or MS. So the resources and scientific research used in HIV AIDS diverts our efforts from other diseases that afflict larger groups of the population. In this way, HIV and AIDS are killing us all. In order to justify the need for this enormous amount of money, the AIDS industry must continually perpetuate the terror of a mass epidemic while making announcements about breakthroughs in research and new drug treatments. Yet the answer, they say, is still years away. To keep the AIDS threat alive, the CDC has used statistical sleight of hand. For example, they keep adding diseases to the AIDS disease list. Naturally, as diseases are added to the list, AIDS cases increase. If the CDC wanted to make it appear that AIDS was going away, all they need to do is subtract diseases from the list. But, as critics state, that would be bad for business. Yet, in spite of all they've done to juggle figures to fit their projections, new AIDS cases continue to decline. Only one out of ten AIDS patients are female, a number that is embarrassingly low for a disease that is said to be spread sexually. So they added cervical cancer, and by the new definition, having less than 200 T cells in HIV antibody, overnight thousands of women became new AIDS patients. And the CDC played it up big with announcements that women are now the fastest growing group of new AIDS cases. For over 12 years now, HIV proponents are still trying to explain exactly how HIV causes AIDS and why in other cases it doesn't. Rather than admit HIV might not be the cause of AIDS, they've gone way on a limb with far-fetched explanations. For example, the reason why Africans are not getting AIDS is because HIV has two strains, HIV-1, which causes AIDS quickly among Americans, and HIV-2, which is weaker and not causing AIDS in Africa. Duesberg argues they are both weak and neither one are doing anything. Another explanation that was proposed was that HIV could be found in the lymph nodes and then migrated to reinfect the body. But this explanation was abandoned even by HIV proponents when it was discovered that the amount of active virus in the lymph nodes was too small and insignificant to generate a reinfection. The most recent attempt to explain HIV's long latent period and how the virus eventually causes AIDS was based on the viral load hypothesis by Zapier Way and David Ho. They claim that HIV slowly wears down the immunity and causes a civil war where the immune system turns on itself. But their procedure of detecting HIV was through a DNA process called quantitative PCR that cannot validate if the virus is active, and their calculations are inconsistent with other valid tests measuring active HIV. In the reappraising AIDS newsletter, mathematician Dr. Mark Craddock uses a time infection rate disease formula to prove that David Ho's viral load hypothesis is mathematically impossible. It's, it's a, desperate, a desperate effort to hold on to HIV. You see, uh, they're endowing HIV with unusual, perhaps even supernatural powers of mutating to evade, hiding in the lymph nodes, doing something else crazy. It's got to, we've, they've got to hold on to HIV. Why? To hold on to their funding. 
Anthony Fauci and the AIDS establishment put out a continual barrage of information about how HIV is thriving in the system and causing AIDS. This fools the public, but it does not change the facts. And the hard fact is, HIV does not work in the real life population studies. It can't go on forever. A lot of us uh, are beginning to see now that uh, the handwriting's on the wall with HIV. It's, it's very difficult uh, uh, for the proponents of the HIV theory to, uh, to persist in the face of, uh, of weekly or monthly uh, evidence to the contrary. For several years, Dr. Richard Stroman has predicted that the AIDS establishment would use a face-saving diversion called cofactors to explain HIV shortcomings. A cofactor is another virus or health problem that works in conjunction with HIV. Many of the HIV advocates are now admitting HIV needs a helper. But Duisburg points out that there is no single cofactor upon which everyone agrees. Even Robert Gallo, who for years had argued that HIV itself was sufficient alone to cause AIDS. Now he has a cofactor, human herpes virus 6, a virus that infects about 85% of the entire population without causing diseases. The question is, will Gallo's herpes virus become the main consensus cofactor? I doubt it. I think it's just the cofactor of the months or the two months of, until the next one comes along. I've seen so many. The whole thing is not an infectious disease, and with another infectious virus, you don't, you don't get around that. It doesn't spread, it's not contagious, it doesn't meet, meet fast law, it's not equally distributed between the sexes. It only occurs decades after, quote, some so-called infection by a factor or cofactor. That's all incompatible with an infectious disease. Although cofactors are being considered even by Gallo and the others, there is still no hint or suggestion from the AIDS establishment that the HIV hypothesis has failed. Not only does the AIDS establishment refuse to fund other hypotheses, they have refused to conduct the critically controlled experiment that would either prove or disprove HIV. As we've seen, the major scientific publications won't even publish a letter suggesting that it should be done. That study has never been done, even all this time after all this money has been spent. Dr. Thomas explains this experiment would match persons from risk groups like homosexuals, IV drug users, and hemophiliacs as identically as possible. You need a group of people who are HIV positive and a group of people who are HIV negative. And then you have to let time go by and see which group dies fastest and of what diseases. Most importantly, it's in, you have to take cognizance of drug consumption and uh, the alloantigen effect, the being the recipient of foreign proteins and multiple infections. But when all of these things are taken under consideration, why, then you can see whether HIV has any effect. That was, would be an experiment that would be very telling whether HIV is causing AIDS or not. You know, that's exactly what we discussed earlier. Is can we identify a group of people who are not drug users, who are not at risk from intoxications, by ACT and cocaine and nitrides and amphetamines, just from HIV? If that could be shown, we would have made a major step in proving or disproving the HIV hypothesis, depending on the outcome of that study. Tragically, this has all happened several times before, and it's not the first time that medical science ignored what was right in front of their face because they were obsessed with the belief that all diseases must be caused by some kind of a germ. In the late 1700s, scurvy, which is caused by a vitamin C deficient diet, was thought to be an infectious disease because it broke out among clusters of sailors on long ocean voyages. Quarantines failed, but when the British Navy began bringing limes aboard, scurvy vanished. Yet, microbiologists continue to search for the germ they believe caused scurvy for another hundred years. During the 1920s, thousands of rural Americans came down with pellagra, a disease caused by a vitamin B niacin shortage. Joseph Goldberger, who was appointed by the U.S. Department of Health, discovered that pellagra was not infectious and the result of poor nutrition. Yet his medical research was completely ignored, and pellagra continued to afflict thousands of lives while researchers chased germs. Recently in Japan, a disease called SMON left thousands paralyzed. It was caused by a drug taken for indigestion. When victims complained of the symptoms, the doctors prescribed even more of the drug. 
It took 10 years for the Japanese germ hunters to give up the search and then finally acknowledge the real cause of smog. This obsession with germs has continually had disastrous results. It's a disgrace uh, for any other disease. Uh, with this much disagreement about the cause, we would by now have a balanced portfolio of alternative propositions. The NIH would be out there calling for proposals having to do with those kinds of things that are known to cause immunosuppression, which uh, are not uh, related to viral causality. That's only prudent. Why we're not doing that uh, is a question that really needs to be asked by the public press and which is not being asked. Why isn't the media addressing this concern? How does the group for reappraisal rate the media's performance? Deplorable. Deplorable. I can't understand why the media have behaved the way they have. For example, if a politician were to give a, a handout to the media, why they would tear it apart with criticism. But somebody from the NIH hands out an equivalent document to the standard media, and they swallow it line and sinker and don't question it at all. They don't even seek a dissenting opinion. I think that they, their overall performance uh, has been a great disservice to the American people. Attempts to present interviews with Peter Duesberg in the major news media have met with strong opposition from Fauci and the AIDS establishment, and they are often canceled. But the issue is not going away. And the argument against HIV is raging on radio talk shows, newspapers, and thought-provoking programs like Tony Brown's Journal. Finally, in 1993, ABC's news magazine Day One became the first major network expose to question HIV and the AIDS establishment. After asking some tough questions, reporter John Hockenberry and the producers were reprimanded by Anthony Fauci and the AIDS establishment. I know that from the producer, Rego so he told me there were already calls from Anthony Fauci. You're risking the nation's health and big health issues at stake. It's not only money, it's not just entertainment. People are dying. And this is this kind of intimidation. It's uh, happening at the, to the reporters just as much as to scientists. Uh, they, if they don't conform, they won't keep their job as the AIDS reporter. An AIDS reporter who had once said HIV is not causing AIDS would not be invited to the next AIDS conference by Fauci or by Bill Paul or Gallo or David Baltimore or David Ho. He would be at home and watching television while it's doing. So he wouldn't have an, a column to report from the meeting or when he comes back. And he wouldn't be in the loop any longer. Writer Celia Farber, who has covered the HIV debate for years, is often harassed by AIDS activists like Martin Delaney. I think science journalists have utterly betrayed people with HIV and AIDS by basically making their sources the powers that be. I mean, they just did not question anything. Even Hollywood has become part of the act. Films, TV dramas, soap operas, and tabloid talk shows spread the fear of HIV and AIDS. Stars and public figures wear red ribbons, appear at fundraising events, and head AIDS research drives. Exploiting the HIV AIDS myth has become quite profitable for film and television companies and has had a tremendous effect on the public perception. Even Congress, which has funded the Titanic AIDS budget, has expressed little concern for scientific integrity. The Congress, like any political body or, in, or any politician, need not worry about what reality is, only the perception of reality. Uh, scientists, on the other hand, it's their job to be concerned about what reality really is. Representative Gil Gutenecht, who dared to ask if HIV might not be what causes AIDS, soon found himself embroiled in controversy with HIV proponents and the huge government-funded research institutions. In a letter to Anthony Fauci, Gutenecht presented 12 questions that challenged the validity of the HIV hypothesis and our national AIDS program. After four months, the response came back from Donna Shalala in a letter that was fraught with prevaricated assertions, undocumented claims, and statements that are false. Indeed, it was more political than scientific. As for the actual proof HIV causes AIDS, she cited prospective and retrospective cohort studies in San Francisco and Africa that have shown that HIV causes AIDS. 
Concerning AZT, again, scientific studies have shown that AZT benefits patients who have AIDS as well as HIV infection. And as for using tax dollars to provide AZT, she says, failure to make this treatment available to HIV-infected pregnant women or other individuals with HIV disease would be unethical. Obviously, the health department has no intent of changing their position. Gutenek says, when these questions are raised, spiracy of silence is deafening, especially among the scientific community. Gutenek believes that this issue needs to be resolved among scientists. But why hasn't it? After 12 years, the AIDS establishment has been unwilling and unable to prove HIV causes AIDS and disputed all other causes. The reason? It's a case of the fox watching the hen house, says Peter Duisberg, who explains that the public is not aware that our enormous AIDS program is being controlled by a small monopoly of government scientists, scientists who are protecting their own vested interests above honest research. These are review panels set up by professionals but the professionals are not without vested interest. These are sensory juries that are set up, selected by the establishment, and people who are already funded by the establishment, who are unlikely to consider an alternative. These are not free juries, these are juries with vested interest. John Lawrenson claims that the FDA has been corrupted before, and he suggests that the powerful AIDS industry is manipulating the public trust. And as Duisburg points out, Nothing good has come out of it at all. They have not saved one single life in 10 years. They have not developed one helpful drug in 10 years. In fact, they're dispersing AZT to 200,000 Americans in the name of a hypothesis that stands unproven, a drug that is the most toxic drug that has ever been licensed for long-term consumption in the free world. By far the most toxic drug. That probably helps 200,000 people to getting AIDS and dying every year. So it's the merits of that monopoly or this structure that is controlling seven and a half billion dollars for its research and treatment and a similar amount for cancer research currently in this country. Duisburg says it's becoming obvious now. We are being deliberately misled. I think it is too late to make the case of innocence that they didn't know any better. They should have asked themselves, even if I had never been around, are we on the right track if we don't get it? That's what's called the scientific method. If a hypothesis fails, you're obliged to consider an alternative, not to defend your vested interest in, in the prevailing hypothesis. Your companies, your papers, your grants, your television notoriety, and so on. Uh, if you're an honest scientist, if you're concerned about the fate of people who pay for it and die from it, you should say, maybe we should look at something else. And that's, they have failed to do. And I think the judgment on them should be just the same as for any other people who fail to live up to professional ethics. Do we uh, call this um, fraud? Uh, that's one word, yes. You could use this. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The it's others. Intentional. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's no longer innocent. I think we should. If they had a Nuremberg trial on this, I don't think they would all be coming home free. <laughs> Is it time the public demanded a congressional investigation? Are the perpetrators of the HIV hypothesis intentionally guilty of scientific misconduct that has caused mass genocide? Will Congress even respond? The AIDS establishment has itself well-rooted in both political parties. HIV is a relic from the Reagan Republicans, but it's been the Democrats in Congress who have continually escalated AIDS funding. During his term, Bill Clinton has raised the AIDS budget $252 million, cannibalizing research funds from other diseases. Critics say that the overfunding of AIDS is what has led to its failure and has enticed scientists into corrupt research like rats to cheese. Many are cynically asking, is AIDS some kind of government conspiracy to eliminate undesirables like homosexuals, IV drug users, and their offspring? Blacks particularly are suspicious. AIDS has hit African Americans extremely hard. How many people have lost a job, gone through a divorce, been imprisoned, taken AZT, had an abortion, or committed suicide because of the HIV hypothesis? Is the war on AIDS part of some global 2000 plan to limit the population? Or is it just the old love of money working through a government program?
the AIDS affair uh, as an, is involving thousands of people who really don't know one another, but they all are acting in what appears to be a purposeful fashion. And um, the only explanation that I can offer is that the hidden hand is in operation again. That the, the hidden hand only works because it, money is involved. Money is exchanging hands uh, in, in, at every level in the market. Is it money that's caused the U.S. Department of Health, Congress, and the media to fail to ensure the public trust? As long as citizens remain vastly unaware of this, there's only one hope left, the grassroots. The group HEAL, which stands for Health Education AIDS Liaison, is one such organization. With chapters now starting around the world, HEAL flatly refuses to take any contributions from the pharmaceutical companies of the AIDS industry and strongly denounces the HIV AIDS death diagnosis. HEAL provides books, videotapes, speaking seminars, and support to anyone affected by HIV. But most importantly, HEAL presents what has long been needed, hope and optimism that AIDS patients can recover. Many of HEAL's members are long-term survivors of the AIDS crisis. Dr. Michael Elner, president of the New York chapter, has been trained in hypnotherapy. He claims that the government's AIDS awareness campaign is a form of mass hypnosis that works psychologically like the witch doctor's magic death bone. Fear of HIV, like fear of the magic bone, drives the believer to visualize that they are dying. I am saying to you that our newspapers, our television, and our doctors are using high-tech electronic bone pointing, HIV, equals AIDS, equals... It's one of the most vicious forms of terrorism I have ever seen. Christine Majori experienced this terror personally when she tested HIV positive. She vividly recalls the fear and hopelessness instilled in her by her physician. Don't waste your money, don't waste your time on vitamins. There's nothing you can do for your immune system. Just wait till you get sick and then we'll give you AZT. Christine became suspicious later when a new HIV test came back inconclusive. Now she's left the AIDS organizations she had at one time been a spokesperson for and heads up the Los Angeles chapter of HEAL. HEAL continually speaks out against the drumbeat of the HIV AIDS death march. But how long will it take until the public is aware? Is there any hope that the scientific community can free itself from the quagmire of its own arrogance? Has our war against AIDS completely lost its objective and now only exists to serve itself? With billions of dollars flowing and over 93,000 AIDS organizations, we have to ask ourselves, how hard are these people trying to put themselves out of work by stopping AIDS? How many lives have we lost? How many hearts have been broken? We are losing the war against AIDS. But what is worse? we are losing the ability to be accountable to reality. Have we put too much confidence in science, the government, and our own integrity? Or is the real problem that we've tried to evade the truth with high-tech excuses and politically correct programs that have only made matters worse? Why is our government spending $13 billion a year to fight a war against drugs, then completely disavowing that drug use itself is the cause of AIDS? Scientists have said that Someday man may live to be a thousand years old. But before that day can come, we have to find a way to stop deceiving ourselves, individually and collectively. If HIV has failed, how long will it take for us to face the facts? You know, this thing is gonna be studied long after our time. This is so much greater than the Lysenko affair. I'm urging all of my colleagues to save all of their papers and, and, and make the historical record as complete as possible. What was, the, what was the dynamics of the, the events that led to poisoning these people with AZT? Because this is a major historical event that is going to be studied for a hundred years. How the United States gave AIDS to the world.
struggling to believe science could provide a quick fix. So the funding began to roll in, and the huge army of virus hunters, who had been unemployed after the unsuccessful virus cancer program, went back to work. They now turned their full attention towards finding the cause and cure for AIDS. Scientists began to speculate that AIDS patients lack the ability to fight infection in blood due to a shortage of T cells that coordinate immunity. In the blood, there are two basic kinds of cells, the red blood cells that carry oxygen and nutrients to all the body, and the white blood cells that hunt down, kill, and destroy infecting bacteria and viruses. When an infection occurs, white blood cells must increase rapidly and produce antibodies to fight it off. They do this through the use of CD4 T cells that act like infection detectives. T cells identify invading viruses then alert the B lymphocyte blood cells to produce antibodies which attack the infection. In a normal immune system, there are about 600 to 1,200 of these T cells in one microliter of blood plasma. But in an AIDS patient, the number of T cells drops down below 200 and lower. This is what is believed to be the direct cause of AIDS. Even this is questionable, though, because many AIDS patients have few or no T cells and remain healthy. But one thing is certain. People with AIDS are losing the ability to generate a strong blood defense against opportunistic infections that constantly attack the body. So, as AIDS progresses, the victim becomes less and less capable of recovering from common diseases like pneumonia, tuberculosis, and the flu. Eventually, the immune system gives out altogether, and the body is ravaged by disease, resulting in death. The objective is clear. Stop what is killing T cells and weakening the immune system, and you have found the cure for AIDS. But what exactly is killing the T cells? Is it really HIV? In the beginning, a number of different causes were suggested. Drugs like heroin, cocaine, popper, barbiturates, and amphetamines had all been observed to harm the immune system. Also, malnutrition, repeated infection, overuse of antibiotics, and stress. But these behavior-related causes were politically incorrect with gay activists who wanted to dist emergency measures, spent $40 billion and mobilized the greatest scientific research effort in the history of man. The war against AIDS has spent more money and utilized more scientific talent than it took to land on the moon. All this to fight a microscopic enemy, and still there are no certain results. After 15 years, the public asks, why? There is a good explanation as to why the war against AIDS has been a total failure. We've spent all our time and money trying to stop this virus, HIV. And as many top research scientists have tried to point out, this virus is not the cause of AIDS. For over 10 years, this argument against HIV has been dismissed by the government, suppressed in the media, and disputed by the political economic powers of the AIDS industry. Yet, since 1987, a growing group of scientists continue to make this unnerving allegation. AIDS research has not failed because it never found a cure. AIDS research has failed because it never found the cause. Is this virus, HIV, really the cause of AIDS? If it isn't, why are we being told this? The virus that causes AIDS. The virus that causes AIDS. The AIDS virus. HIV, the virus that the virus, the virus that causes AIDS. The public has been very supportive, yet with over 100,000 research papers published on HIV and AIDS, there is still no direct proof HIV causes immune deficiency. The entire government-funded approach to fighting AIDS is based on this unproven hypothesis hanging from a frayed thread, and with the weight of mounting evidence against it, this hypothesis is in serious trouble. In fact, the entire international effort to stop AIDS has all its eggs in one beaker. Time, money, treatment, and millions of human lives hang in the balance. If HIV is not the cause of AIDS, millions of people have been told that they're going to die for no reason at all, and hundreds of thousands have been treated with permanently impairing drugs, some of which could cause AIDS themselves. If HIV does not cause AIDS, how many lives have been lost to a misdiagnosis, and how many more will die in the future? In the next few minutes, we will present 10 scientific arguments that explain why HIV does not cause AIDS, what the causes could be, 
and why treatments with dangerous drugs like AZT are unnecessary and cause the very disease they're supposed to prevent. We will also explain to you why this information has been kept back from the public awareness and why the U.S. Department of Health, the pharmaceutical industry, and AIDS activist organizations have perpetrated this myth. As citizens, taxpayers, and people who also someday could be at the mercy of a misguided program like this, we hope you will see the importance of this issue. Is HIV the cause of AIDS? If not, as Neville Hodgkinson of the London Sunday Times put it, then we will have witnessed the greatest medical scientific blunder of the 20th century. Nearly everyone has been affected by AIDS. Whether it's a friend or a lover, a business acquaintance, or even a perfect stranger, AIDS has had an impact on our entire culture. The dread hangs silently over society, and there's little hope on the horizon. It's time we ask ourselves some serious questions. Could we be on the wrong track with HIV? Have we jumped to conclusions that will only lead to a dead end? Are we willing to accept the truth, even if it means that our whole campaign against AIDS has been in vain. To understand just how HIV became the target of this international war on AIDS, we have to look back at how it all began, but set into motion the chain of events that many say misled objective science. Following the depression of the 30s and World War II, America emerged into a new era of technology and prosperity. We had more time for recreation and self-realization. Society began to change. Medical science had new breakthroughs. We conquered polio, the last great infectious epidemic of the modern world. Soon, new antibiotics cured everything from minor infections to venereal disease. With the invention of the birth control pill came the sexual revolution, freeing the public from age-old fears and taboos. Homosexuality, too, found more freedom of expression as gays came out of the closet and formed their own subculture. During the Vietnam era of the 60s, recreational drug use skyrocketed among the young and would continue to grow. Yet, we remained optimistic that we could solve all our problems through our new faith in science and technology. But before long, the unforeseen consequences of this new liberated lifestyle began to rear its ugly head. Silently in the hinds, the bell began to toll. When the first reports of immune deficiency surfaced in 1981, among a small group of gay men in Los Angeles, it was believed to be a result of behavior unique to homosexuals. But all that changed when similar conditions started showing up in IV drug users and hemophiliacs. That set off an alarm. What had been called gay-related immune deficiency now appeared to be an infectious disease that might spread throughout the entire population. This threat of a deadly blood disease being spread by sexual contact was sensationalized by the media and enraged gay activists who demanded action from the government. Public health officials issued strong warnings that this new immune disease could be acquired sexually by anyone. Suddenly, immune suppression common to drug addicts, homosexuals, advanced TB patients, and scores of other diseases became linked together in a microbiological search for a common cause. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, was born. As the bathhouses in San Francisco closed and the fear of AIDS spread, the U.S. Department of Health came under heavy fire to find the cause and remedy quickly. The public was willing. They've got to hold on to HIV. Why? To hold on to their funding. It's a disgrace uh, for any other disease 
uh, with this much disagreement about the cause, we would by now have a balanced portfolio. The dispersing AZT to 200,000 Americans in the name of a hypothesis that stands unproven, a talk that is the most toxic talk that has ever been licensed in long-term consumption in the free world. How the United States gave AIDS to the world. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, known best by its acronym. Four letters we've been told to fear. The AIDS crisis is very real. Its dark form casts a shadow over the statistics of the dead and dying. Virtually none existed in 1980. By 1995, AIDS had afflicted over one and a half million lives globally, half a million in the United States alone. AIDS has become the leading singular cause of death in U.S. males between the ages of 25 and 44. It's been called the plague of this century and portrayed like some medieval nightmare. It knows no pity and respects no limits. We've been told that it can strike anyone and everyone is at risk. For over 15 years now, AIDS has terrorized social America and still there is no cure. What causes AIDS? We've been told that AIDS is caused by this tiny retrovirus, its name is HIV, and virtually everyone who is infected with it is expected to develop any one of 30 different diseases, all of which ultimately result in death. To stop HIV and AIDS, the U.S. government has enacted